You are joining Making a Difference with Melissa Clark, a new show that shares the compelling stories and voices of well-known and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Enjoy our guests. Call in or just listen to be inspired for this show was made with you in mind. Please join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guests. And you can listen to our recast at www.melissaclarkshow.com. Hi, thank you so much for joining us here on Making a Difference. I'm Melissa Clark. I am thrilled to have actor, director, producer, incredible writer, Mr. Larry Romano on the show today. You may best know him as Richie on the hit show, The King of Queens. We discussed everything from his brush with cancer to his amazing career and what we are going through uh, in the world today. We're going to get his point of view and his passion never seems to amaze me. So check it out. Hey, Larry, how are you? How you doing, Melissa? How are you? I'm good. How you doing? You're back in Missouri. You just visited New York City, and now you're back in Missouri. How'd that go? Yeah, you know, everything's cool. Just working on, uh, you know, working out with Gateway to Hope and uh, raising money for the uh, women's charity for women with breast cancer, doing that um, with the Cameo and uh, Extreme Autographs to You, mm -hmm. um, which all proceeds going to Gateway to Hope, which I'm really excited about because, you know, I mean, you get to help out people that really need help, you know, breast cancer, serious stuff, through the whole deal with cancer, you know, and they need help because, you know, they need help with your bills and stuff like that. And I saw uh, Monique Levy, she was on the, uh, on the television station, early morning show out here, and I caught it and I saw what they were doing. And I says, I'd like to see if I could join on and get on board and help out. And uh, so, yeah, that's what we're doing, working with Cameo, Awesome. Happy birthday, Merry Christmas, whatever. Happy they can go to your website, LarryRomano.com, to find the, um, or they go to Cameo. Go to Cameo, yeah. I guess you look at it, Cameo, Autographs for You, Extreme Autographs. There's a couple of different places out there. So tell us about your time on The King of Queens. Uh, that was a wonderful sitcom in the 90s. Uh, you played Richie. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, how is that like? How did, how did you get that, oh, well, that role? that you know came about i had just finished a movie called the thin red line and um you know i went on the audition for the king of queens and obviously i got the role so i got to be a part of a you know classic historical uh sitcom very fortunate mm. yeah how you were on that show for two seasons two yeah yep mm -hmm. you did two seasons yep how did you feel when you heard about jerry stiller he just recently passed away well i mean yeah i mean obviously it was not you know it's very very sad news. It's the end of a legend and era. Um, yeah. You know, I, you know, he was just a fantastic guy to work with and fan fantastic guy to be around. You know, and beyond that, he comes from a generation that's, you know, steadily disappearing, you know, guys that, you know, come from that time in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not too many of them left. So, um, you know, along with him dies all those stories. That. Uh, what do you mean by that? You mean like old school Hollywood um, folks? Yeah, I mean, these are people that lived in different, you know, lived through different times. We're all living through, obviously, we're all living through tough times right now with the, yeah. um, but these guys also did too with different kinds of tough times, but, you know, and they had their own stories, you know, new, before cell phones, before before people had houses in their, in, uh, phones in their houses, you know, you had to go down to the candy store and, you know, put a dime in there, you know, and, you know, that's that's the generation that that guy came from and that doesn't exist anymore. So w with him, you know, part of that all, you know, is going slowly bye bye, you know. Yeah. But, and Hollywood is changing uh, as well. Right. In your opinion, uh, Hollywood has changed. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, those guys, there was a lot of interesting guys out there, you know, back in uh, back in the day. And, you know, the world has um, changed, obviously, you know. Well, you know Hollywood and you know A-listers. You've worked with Al Pacino, um, Sil uh, Sylvester Stallone, Johnny Depp, Mickey Rourke. Yeah. What was that like, Larry, working with those guys? Well, I mean, you know, going back to the whole thing with Hollywood, like right now, like back, you know, going back to Jerry Stiller's time and going back to like 
Don Rickles and all those guys, you know, those guys were like hardcore Americans, you know, they mm-hmm. were believers in America, you know, and, and they come from a time when Hollywood would blacklist communists. And, you know, the way it feels right now in Hollywood is that they blacklist Americans. They don't, <laughs> it's like the opposite switch, you know, and um, which makes it, I think, in a lot of ways, a lot less interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, they make movies out there that, you know, are made by Americans, but, you know, with a sale to a foreign audience on their mind, as opposed to in the 70s when they just made movies. They were Americans and they made movies, you know, because they had great stories to tell. Now it's like a business model, which kind of, you know, it makes that learning a little contrived, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's probably a little boring to work in that in that realm, you know, and getting back to how it was, you know, Sly Stallone and Al Pacino, they come from a time when they had you know, um, you know, look what Sly did with Rocky creatively, you know, look at the roles that Al Pacino played, you know, from starting off with Panic in Needle Park and then, you know, Serpico and, um, you know, uh, really fantastic stories, you know, that these guys got to be a part of. Well, you are part of a fantastic story, The Thin Red Line. How was that? You went to Australia for six months. Uh, what was your role? in that uh in that film um, i was a soldier boy you know going world war ii and uh going out there and you know a lot of things we learned about war in that particular movie is we got to you know hang out with guys that were in wars and you know nobody's really enthusiastic about going into combat i mean people might say they might be i don't know but it's you know you're going to get shot at and so it's you know my particular character really didn't want to be there and much like most other guys they didn't want to be there but um you know, that, that's what I learned a lot on that, you know, from that point of view. And then the filmmaking, I got to work with Terrence Malick and, and John Toll, who's a DP, director of photography, and some really terrific actors, Jimmy Caviezel, Tim Blake Nelson, um, and, you know, the usual suspects, you know, like uh, Sean and stuff, you know, get to hang out with those guys and live in Sean Australia. Sean Penn? Yeah, Sean, yeah. I work with Sean, yeah. Did you talk to anybody um, in the... Um military to find out exactly like being forced somewhere that you don't want to be or how did how did you prepare for that we did two weeks in military training in the bush in australia which was pretty cool yeah two weeks without a bath (laughs) yeah that was really yeah that was pretty big adjustment you know i mean you couldn't take a bath and no, I mean, what are you going to do? You're in a bush, you know? I mean, uh. out there in the wilderness, you know, bathing, you know. But anyhow, that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was definitely an experience getting to do work on that movie. Yeah. yeah. So that's pretty interesting that you worked with all these, um, these top people. Um, and in my opinion, I think you should be top because you are uh, such an incredible writer and director. And we're going to talk about your film Saturday in the Park. But, you know, for the listeners, um, a film that you uh, directed and you wrote, uh, but for the listeners, for a new actor coming out um, and working with an A-list star, what, what advice would you give to them so they're not so nervous? Well, you know, I mean, I really... Um, you know, I, I guess Sylvester Stallone was fantastic. It was my first big movie to work with Sylvester Stallone. And, you know, we, we rehearsed the scene together. We went over the scene together and he was willing to talk about the scene. So each actor is different, you know. Were you nervous when you first met him? So I was really cool. He was very welcoming and talked about the scene and talked about what we're going to do here and how it is and X, Y, and Z. So that was, uh, that was good, you know. Um, as far and what as would it, you tell somebody who's about to work with somebody like that? What would it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, just play it by ear, really. You know, I guess. You know, I mean, stars could be in good moves; they could be in bad moves. You know. And yeah. That's the thing about working with stars, you don't know sometimes what you might get. I mean, there's some notorious guys out there that you don't want to be really even around. So. But, Have um, you ever had an experience like that before? Where the where the workplace was uncomfortable. Yeah, you don't have to say any names, but just you yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Where you really just decide, like, man, is this really like where you want to be? You know, do you want to be around these people? Do they fall into the life is too short, no matter how long the money is, type of situation? I think everybody probably falls into that in all businesses mostly. You know? And uh, let's talk about Saturday in the Park. Mm, yeah, that is a wonderful uh it's based on a play that you were actually in yeah it's a play i wrote when yeah. i was in the strasburg theater institute in wow. new york city and they put it on as a work in progress we were, uh, way back in 
Mm -hmm. And as you know, the movie said in 1986. Yes, yes. Very Fantastic cool. coverage, by the way. Um, yeah, I really like the vintage uh, scenery in the Bronx. Is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the Bronx. Yeah, we had so to work cool. hard to get the costumes and the automobiles and the locations. And um, the challenge was getting the actors that were yes. you know, able to pull that off. And I feel as if, you know, we, we have uh, actors that are unknown, which I think that's fantastic because they were given the opportunity to play these roles, which, I mean, you saw the movie, you saw the performances. I loved it so much. The writing was fantastic. Thank and it you. took a lot for two new actors to uh, be able to, um, you know, do the dialect and, and, and keep up with the scene, you know? Yeah, they, I think that the entire, the entire cast, I mean, uh, uh, one of the guests you had on, Catherine Amicio, plays the mom. She yes. was good. Chuck Zito was really good as the dad. Pete Antico as the guy who owns the local bar. Um, you know, they were just, you know, Sammy Guzman. It was, I think that we was able to really get, and I think, you know, I know for a fact that the experiences I've had as an actor, and it's whether from casting, going out on auditions, or being on the set and studying, I think that uh, was a, phenomenal asset to uh, being able to direct these guys Obviously, yeah on the material so well as too but i think that became a really you know fantastic asset and um i enjoyed it tremendously um it was, it's uh, a I wonderful think. film and Thank you know you. besides um katarina's uh katarina michio her uh talent she also has her beautiful artwork in there which you were very fond of um so I just wanted to uh, ask yeah, you initially how I got, you know, I found Catherine, you know, I saw, I saw her, her work on, uh, on display at the cutting room in New York city. And, yeah. Uh, and I spoke with her and I saw her, you know, she does a lot of musical artists, uh, you know, Louis Armstrong, B.B. King and Steven Tyler, a lot of really cool stuff. And I think that it, you know, uh, the lead character played by Ilya Constantine, his name, his character is Danny. I wanted his mom to be an artist of some sort. Right. And uh, Katharina came in, she read, she nailed it, and we used her art in the movie, which I think you saw her in the, in the production design, right? Yes. It would, yeah, it, would, it was actually a wonderful film. Um, and just wondering when you're going to uh, release it. Mm, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> it's a piece of art. Um, yeah. You know, obviously there's commerce involved in art. Um, and you know, as you you enjoyed the movie, you enjoyed watching it. So, yes. <clears throat> as far as seeing a movie, I don't know. I think we might just have private screenings where people could pay for us to come, you know, to their house to cast, and they could get their friends together, like under ten people, because we have to have gatherings under ten. Or a right. restaurant, maybe. Where, I mean, if they put the limit up to fifty, we all wear a mask. Or we all get whatever. <laughs> so, um, but or you wait until you know after November fourth, and everything will be fine. We could have all sorts. God willing. <laughs> yeah, you know, and we could have crowds of a hundred. Well, actually, we could disguise it as a riot or a protest. <laughs> it's true. You have masses of people just come down with no mask and yell at the screen. And, ah, and it's know. sad but true. <laughs> it's true, right? It's, we're not, we're not, we're not telling any fibs here. We're no. Truth. If we wanted to have a protest with hundreds and hundreds of people right now, we're good. But yeah. If we're open, you know. A restaurant, you got a business, you can't, you got to have people six feet away. To be five, to be it. I know so, we're in, we're right. in uh, crazy times right now. We're in crazy times and, you know, and that's, uh, it is what it is. Well, I think it's very um, enlightening times. I think we can see a lot of what's going on because it's because we're American. I oh, mean, we're stupid. Yeah. It's on. But uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So anyhow, back to showing the movie, I guess that if, um, if a group of people wanted to see the movie, yeah, maybe have the director come and hang out. We get some, you know, water pizzas and stuff like that. And we could, even, I don't know, maybe figure out somewhere we have donations go to charity or something like that. We just show the movie in that house. Hey, we can enjoy ourselves and watch the movie like you did. Well, tell uh, tell the audience what the film is about, please. Um, it's semi-autobiographical. It's about two lifelong buddies, a guitar player and a drummer, and um, they're at the crossroads of their lives, which means they're in their early 20s and figuring out what they want to do with their lives, like, like most of us at that age. Yeah. And, and, um, 
and times are changing, obviously, for the drummer at that particular time in history. The drum machine was becoming very prominent, you know, and for a drummer, the music scene was changing. And um, in New York City at that particular time, the crime rate was very, very high, much like it is now again. Yeah. And uh, the only thing the difference is, I think it was more crack fueled back then, you know, a lot of gun violence, a lot of crack, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these kids are working to make their way through it. And it's two lifelong pals who spend a Saturday night in the park they grew up in, and they uh, decide their future. Right. In New York City, where, and that's um, that's what the movie's about. It was, you know, it was a play. We did it at Lee Strasberg, then we went to Off Off Broadway, and that's where Sly Stallone's casting agent, uh, Joy Todd, she saw the play, and boom, Bob. Next thing you know, I'm in a movie with Sylvester Stallone. So, so I played, I actually played both roles on stage. I played Danny on stage in New York and I mm -hmm. played Mikey when we did it in Los Angeles. And in this particular movie, I play nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you decided not to be, uh, partake in the film, but just to be behind the not scenes. As an actor, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel as a like cheesy when he's like, like if, unless you're like Orson Welles or Sly Stallone or Woody Allen. I mean, Kevin, obviously Kevin Costner did it, but he was already so established, you know, as an actor. And he'd been on so many productions and he's worked, he had worked with so many, you know, professionals that when it came time to doing dances with wolves, you know, we had a really great crew around him, you know, Peter, producers and so on and so forth. So in mm -hmm. one particular instance, I didn't have that yeah. experience, but you need a real you know, you need an experienced team around you. And we really, we, we really use a lot of upstarts, but it came out great, man. You know, I love I it. Want to be, I, I couldn't act in it, you know, Melissa, I just couldn't do that. I no, I hear you. you. You know, I saw something on Facebook. Um, Reese Witherspoon actually did that. She couldn't get any roles uh, in any films. I don't know why she's a fantastic actor. So she started her own production company and that's when she did Legally Blonde. And that became a huge hit. No, I don't know so, that. Story, oh, you don't know that story? No, nah, but I'm sure that happens, you know, if you yeah. do stuff like that. But, you know, yeah. I don't know that particular story. I didn't know that at all. Legally Blonde, really? Yeah, she started, yeah, she, she starred yeah. and she produced in it. And that's how, you know, it became a big hit. Hmm. Um, but once again, you know, the talent has to be there as well. So, oh, yeah. I, yeah, and you need you know. people around you. It's a team effort. Yeah. You need yeah. producers who are on board and you know, knowledge and, you know, blah, blah, and you're not in the so, and you need like the photography and costumes and, you know, just, you know, hair and makeup, you need the whole squad, man, you know, and you right. need fantastic actors who are totally going to show up and dedicate themselves to the, to the project, you know. What's the two uh, fella, the two guys who played Danny and Mike, that beautiful. Uh... Danny is uh, played by Ilya Constantine. And uh, phenomenal young actor, and uh, Mikey is played by Aaron Sorter, another awesome, phenomenal actor. Great, yeah, yeah, that was that was a really good film. I hope everybody goes and and uh, requests Larry. <laughs> Where can they find you to request if they want to? Um, I, mean, I don't know. They could call you. You're gonna, you're gonna put okay, so phone. reach out to me. I actually act as his PR yeah. sometimes. Right. <laughs> so reach out, yeah. reach out to me, and uh, I'll I'll call Melissa one eight hundred Melissa. <laughs> crazy guy you can send me an email melissa at melissa com if you'd like to see a private screening of it it's it's a fantastic film the writing is incredible that's the you know and this this guy's pretty amazing so um um thank you so much for putting that out into the universe and i hope a lot of people see it yeah. let's discuss a very sensitive topic of uh you went through uh throat cancer you had stage three throat cancer um when was that larry Started in 2016 and, you know, carried on for quite some time. Still deal a little bit here and there as far as the ramifications of mm -hmm. the treatment, which, you know, entailed the 38 blast of radiation to the neck and head area and like a bunch of chemotherapy. Wow. And, uh, you know, feeding tube and all of that stuff. So it's been a kind of bit of a little bit of a setback, you know. You Were know. you ever scared in that? Like, did the doctor ever say that you have... Um, uh, you know, which, what your survival rate was? I or? really, if anything, you know, scared. No, I think that I was just more frustrated that this was going to be, obviously, I, I didn't think it was going to be this big a delay. Yeah, you know, it was a hiccup you know, in your life. A serious one, yeah. It took a lot mm. more, still, still taking a lot more time than, you know, I really anticipated, man. It really set you back. 
you know, which is, you know, part of, you know, a big reason why I'm, you know, working with Gateway to Hope to help people get back on their feet and stay on their feet, you know, because I understand that this is, you know, this is a very, you know, just because you got over it, you know, it doesn't mean your body is coming back right away. So that's, that's, that could be an issue, you know, so for a lot of people. And you lost a lot of weight. How yeah, much weight did you was, lose? I went down 125 pounds, man, you know, and I went into a feeding tube and, and it was, um, like I said, I, I didn't, even when I started the treatments, I thought that I was going to be able to be, you know, bouncing around and so on and so forth. But uh, I was, I was wrong about that. That's for sure. Because it really knock you, knock you out, man. 35 uh, shots. And, you know, really, I guess, I guess when we talk, well, now that we're talking about this, the reality is, and in, in tying in Saturday in a Parker movie, I got to give much love to my friend John Shogren, who, who edited the movie, deferred. He didn't, he didn't take a salary to edit the movie that you have, that you saw right now. Mm -hmm. And then he pretty much drove me to chemo and radiation every day for seven weeks. Uh, uh, yeah, so on that note, you know, that was, I was very fortunate there too. There's a lot of people that don't have a support team around them to do that. No. You know? It's no. tough, man, you know, and um, well, on, on that note, you know, but uh, you know, that's that's why we're doing the thing with Cameo and uh, and Extreme uh, Autographs, Autographs to You. That's why we're doing part of that is because that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. See if we can Thank help. you. Thank you for helping people with cancer. As you know, my mother passed away from cancer um, and, uh, you know, you had a couple of people in, I'm sure, in your life passed away from cancer um so tough deal, man. Yeah. it is a tough deal uh and, and yeah. you know it is what it is so but uh breathe fresh air carry on don't be stressful yeah don't deal with people who cause you stress and aggravation well that's what i wanted to just ask you as well um you know after your weight loss you know did you get uh feedback from people negative feedback of how you looked and they didn't know what you went through because you weren't really public with it well, yeah, man, you know, I mean, obviously, look, you know, I think I've told, I mean, we've talked about this before that, you know, no matter who you are, if you're a professional athlete, you're, um, you know, you're in the entertainment business, you're a musician, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, a politician, people are going to look to hit you any which way they can. That's just the way it is, man. You know, it's like, you're going to stick your head above the crowd, you know, people that want to chop your head off. And that's the first that's right. lesson you have to learn about it. pretty much not just being in entertainment or being in the limelight, but you just have to realize that that's just the way it is, man. Whether even if you're going to school, I'm sure there's kids in high school like that, you know, there's people looking to want to take them down a notch all the time, you know, spread rumors about girls or spread rumors about this. It's, you know, but so you got to just like suck it up. So yeah, people say that like some not so nice things about, you know, whatever because I did lose a bunch of weight, you know what I mean, and all yeah. that, you know, it was a, I took a beating, you know what I mean, but, um, whatever, man, you know, I'm still here, slamming, jamming, and rocking, yeah. and I think you know that <laughs> right now, yeah, but I'm still kicking in, I can still capable of quite a lot, thank God, and, um, and yes, yeah. still, thank God, and if you don't believe in God, well, then that would be, your, that's your business, we live in America, so you're free to believe that you don't believe in God. And uh, God willing, we will retain those freedoms moving forward because yeah. what we're going on through right now is that, you know, as well as I know, and I think you experienced it, we talked about this as well too, is that you have this cancel out, whatever, yeah. society, cancel out gang, crew, you know what, and it will cancel you out, man, you know? Yeah. Oh, people that you know, you don't you you express your opinions. If it's not on par with what they believe, they cancel you out. And it's like, that's not going to fly in, in, in America, bro. It's just not going to fly. Right. So let's, let's talk about that really quick. Um, and, and thank you for sharing your, um, your story uh, with cancer. I know that, you know, you don't really talk about it that much. So I really thank you. Um, and uh, I, just one thing before we go into the next topic, uh, what advice would you give to somebody who is going through cancer right now? You know, man, I guess, you know, just, you know, eat a lot of, if you're going to eat, be able to eat organic food is good, you know, and just start to breathe, and breathe, and, you know, you know, you know have, be mind strong, you know, let your mind be strong, you know, mm -hmm. that's about really all I could say, your mind be strong, you know. Your Did spirit. you find yourself a little bit more spiritual after that uh, journey, or even now, do you, um, are you a spiritual person, Larry? 
I would say absolutely, yeah, without a doubt. I just said, thank God and God willing, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, spiritual yeah. and like well, meditation. I mean, you and... know, I mean, yeah, a little bit, you know, I guess, you know, I guess so much. So, yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, let's, um, let's discuss uh, what we're about to talk about with animals and um, what do you call that? Canceling out? <laughs> cancel out the cancel out crew cancel, cancel out, out crew so, and full discrimination where you get discriminated because people uh because you don't agree with somebody 100 percent, which is the political discrimination you know? yeah so i uh i had introduced you and david zier david zier is a uh talk show host from studio si is it studio six studio B? no studio b and studio uh, b america's voice America's voice and he's a wonderful man and uh, you guys um, hit it off very well because you have the same beliefs. I work with a lot of serious musicians and the song that came out based on you know, what's going on right now and but you're a very talented drummer as well, if I can just add that in. I don't in. know about drumming, man. Not really. You know, I mean, no, I can keep, just... Yeah, I'm all right. You know, I mean, I don't think you ever heard me. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Oh, you're pretty well, good. Well, you know, I'm all right. I'm not, you know, but and this, this tune right here, you know, Angelo Barbera. Yeah. Just, I'm a musician. He does, he plays everything, the drums, the bass, the bongos, and he produces it. And I, you know, I wrote the lyrics and, and the music is his. I wrote the lyrics and I performed the lyrics. And then um, David uh, had the video done there, Divide and Conquer, which is pretty fiery, you know, which uh, got you in a little bit of hot water because we thanked you for introducing us. And the next thing you know, Melissa's in trouble. Out cancer. of a dog because of you now. <laughs> the dog loses. The dog loses because of the cancel out lady. So he let's let let me just let's just he tell what. Evil. Let me just say what happened. Um, I was supposed to get a little Pomeranian. I was supposed to adopt a little Pomeranian dog that was just born what two months ago. So the breeder has been calling the dog uh, the name that I chose that I've chosen. I spoke to her. Um, I have a public program here where you can where I really don't, you know, I, I am who I am. I, I'm not different in real life. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, Larry, you know, my friends can vouch for me. So um, Larry had tagged me. She saw it and we're friends on the on Facebook and uh, and she called me up and she says, I'm not giving you this animal because you're uncompassionate. You have no compassion. Because uh, you're being a Trump supporter, which the video has absolutely nothing to do with Donald I'm not even a Trump supporter. <laughs> You know why? Like, even if you were, that's the yeah. president of the United States. Even if of you course. were, that's the constitutional right. You I support can't... the president. You know, I support what's going on in our country because he's our president, so I'm respecting him. I just, you know, and I can't support or believe in a woman who denies a dog a home. Well, you give the dog a beautiful home, you and Elvis, and she's going to tell you all of a sudden that you can't have this dog because you got tagged in a video that that to a song that i wrote but that dog wasn't for me i guess and um i just pray that that uh, precious beautiful so beautiful little gorgeous little pomeranian uh gets a great harm because you know hendrix here anybody who knows me and my dog uh hendrix gets treated better than than human beings so, <laughs> so you know and i think the whole the whole thing to come out of this is that you know the understanding is that um people that are going this far to discriminate against others for political whatever is gone too far yeah and the people that have yet to go as far as this woman has gone need to like reel in those people or start to put the brakes on this whole thing because you can't you know i can't sit there and say hey you don't believe in what i believe in i don't care if this is america and i'm going to cancel you out or i'm going to like discriminate against you and not give you an animal and that's what's going on right now. And that's a, that's a big, um, in a lot of ways, your freedoms right now as an American right now, uh, potentially can, they're being trampled on. They are being trampled on. Yours was, your, your, you, you were just trampled on. The dog was just trampled on. And uh, that's a disgusting thing. And uh, it's you- It's not kind, know, it's not yeah, kind. Watch and the video, Divide and Conquer, and there's more where that came from. Ah. It's a good video, actually, because it does oh, yeah. talk about what's going on in today's world. And everybody, you know, if you don't uh, agree with the people, then you're just wrong. So I don't know what to say about that. But we are going to have you on uh, another episode um, with uh, Dr. Cooper Lawrence. She wrote a book about um, celebrities and politics. And I'd love for you to be a part of that because you're so open 
uh, in speaking about all this. So um, I think I think we are good, and you're an amazing person. And I want you to do cameo. Wait a oh weekend. yeah, cameo, gay way to hope. Autographs to you. Phone in, zero in, send a video. Even if you don't like the King of Queens, even if you don't like Richie, you can have me say whatever you want me to say. Well, within reason. Larry, you know, tell us, uh, you know what I forgot? Tell us why you left the King of Queens. Why did you depart from that show? Um, <laughs> I think I want to save that for the book. <laughs> book. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, um, oh, wait, did you see that video that we did for the song for the King and Queens, the theme song that we wrote? Yes, we I did. Yes, and yes, and yes I love it. Where can... Um, I send you a link, man. You send know? me a link. I'll put it in put with your, your bio. Yeah, you know? So that's like a really, that's just, you know, how I express myself lyrically, musically, you know? There's a lot of music that we got quite a few records already written. Mm-hmm. Once again, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I might release some stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, you can look up some stuff on the band and all that stuff that when we were playing live, but like, um, I like to, you know, I could, I could express myself lyrically and the King of Queens is like a nice little jingle. You know what I mean? A nice little friendly song opposite of Divide and Conquer, of course, where I'm just like pissed off and just like, rah, you know what I mean? Like the other one. Do I'm you like, lose... Can I just ask you kindly, do you lose a lot of people in your life um, because of your political uh, status? Well, I've been discriminated against in Hollywood, I, you know, obviously. And, you know, like I said, back in the day, when Jerry still the day, you know, they used to blacklist communists. Now they blacklist Americans. So, yeah, I'm definitely swimming upstream over there, man, you know, without a doubt. But that's OK, too, because... I'm, you know, fortunate, like, you know, you says, I, I could write, I could write movies and I could produce our own products. We don't need Hollywood machine, you yeah. know, but we do, we got talent onto ourselves, you know, obviously, and we got the internet, you know, we don't need them, but yeah, uh, definitely lost the work, a lot of work, you don't, you know, can't get agency representation because of these political points of view and so on. Well, not, that's just not, not even my point of view, it's just the fact that I don't go along with their program. Not. You don't drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Come on. So here's, I want to tell you, just to wrap it up real quick. Man, sure. To summarize the whole thing. 2005, I went out with the USO to visit the troops in Germany. And I sort of met the troops. I met the families. I met their kids. Mm-hmm. And I met the, un, the most unselfish human beings on earth that you ever want to meet. People that wake up at five o'clock, three o'clock, whatever time in the morning to go out and service other people. You and I, sure. Americans. Sure. These are the guys, these, these people that give these people the right to protest. Not the right to riot because that's really not, you don't really have a right to burn down other people's property as they've been doing. And as nobody under, you know, nobody is telling them to stop other than the president. Yeah. That's, that side of the aisle. But, you know, these are the USO, these are the troops, these are the people that, you know, give us the freedoms to have our freedom, you know? Mm-hmm. And then you return back to Hollywood where you come from a world where you just was with the most unselfish human beings in the world who fight for other people's freedoms. And you come to Hollywood and you meet the most selfish, self-centered people you ever want to meet in your life. And it's hard to, it's hard to take them seriously after that. It really is. It's very difficult to take them seriously because they are so self-centered, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, um, yeah, that's, so that's the summary. We're in America right now and we don't need to be in Hollywood to make really great entertainment for the rest of America and the world. Yeah. So the world sees Saturday in the park. The world knows that it's a movie that was made by an American raised in America. And it was not made as a piece of contrived to get your money. Yeah. And it's authentic. It's authentic and quintessential New York. So if you, if anybody's from New York, they can relate, um, you know, to, um, to the scenes and, and I just, I, I really like it a lot. So I'm looking forward to, uh, people seeing it. All right, Melissa. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. We'll talk soon.